thanks uh, for inviting me and uh, and thank you for having such a wonderful seminar. Um, I'll use the iPad for for the talk. Um, so the basic object that I want to discuss today uh, is um, directional lattices. So I will explain what they are in a moment, and I'm gonna condition them uh, in some way and and discuss their distribution. That's the the plan. Um, so we'll start by by defining uh, what are the directional lattices uh, and uh, and in which spaces they live in, um, and then we'll discuss uh, uh, what do I mean by conditioning. I'm gonna uh, condition to a, to a certain surface uh, and discuss the main result. And uh, the, the the main bulk of the talk that I want to kind of dedicate the talk to is to discuss the structure of the proof because I think it's a um, it's kind of a, a demonstration of a, of a, I think a powerful technique from a, that kind of demonstrates how uh, dynamics and ergodic theory can uh, interact very nicely with the with questions in uh, number theory and geometry of numbers. Um, so that's the plan for for the talk, and let's uh, maybe begin. So I want to discuss now um, directional lattices. Uh, so let's uh, fix a dimension n. N is the dimension, uh, and. Let's fix a lattice in Rn, so lambda inside Rn, uh, a lattice. Uh, and fix a vector uh, V, which is, a, say, a primitive vector in lambda. So I will denote the primitive vectors in a lattice by lambda prim. Uh, it's not necessary that the vector is primitive, but it's just uh, you'll see that it doesn't add more information if I, if I consider a non-primitive uh, vector. Um, and in some sense, the, the notion of directional lattice comes to uh, uh, capture, so the directional lattice uh, let me call it d v lambda. This is going to capture uh, the way that lambda looks like, uh, or in direction v, in direction v. So uh, what you do is you let uh, pi v v perp be. This is a uh, an orthogonal projection from R n to uh, to the ortho complement of v to the space v perp inside Rn, so the hyperplane orthogonal to uh, to V. Uh, this is orthogonal projection. And I define the directional lattice uh, of lambda in direction V to be simply the image uh, under this orthogonal projection of the lattice lambda, okay? So it kills the direction uh, V uh, and you're left out with a with a certain lattice. If this is V, you end you end up with a lattice on the auto complement. Uh, so this is uh, a lattice of maybe I, I would call it yeah. So it's a, it's a lattice of rank uh, n minus one in V perp. Uh, and the basic. Uh, uh basic question that we were we are going to ask or is uh how does uh the directional lattice dv lambda uh, behave when um when lambda is fixed and uh, V varies 
uh, in lambda prime and maybe the the conditioning uh, or maybe uh, v varies in uh, in lambda prime under some condition conditions so that's the basic thing that I'm going to to discuss and uh, it's from the number theoretic point of view it's um, it's very kind of natural to take lambda to be uh, zn so the first the first maybe thing to to ask is uh, um, where or in which spaces where uh, do these objects uh, live in. So if I'm going to discuss the distribution of them or the density of them or whatever, um, I need to put them in put them in some space. So uh, the space that I'm going to, to consider is I'm calling it x n minus one n. So this is the space. Uh, the points in the space are rank uh, n minus one. Um, discrete subgroups of uh, of Euclidean n space of Rn uh, and maybe uh, we're going to so since we are only uh, interested in the in the geometry of of uh, the these uh, n minus one lattices we're going to uh, wash it out by scaling okay so this is homothety or scaling or scaling. Okay, so that's the space. And if you if you want to equip it in a in a natural way with the topology and, and structure, then maybe you can note that uh, x n minus one n uh, uh, is acted upon uh, transitively by uh, by S L N R. So, so it is a quotient. So x n minus one n is um, is a quotient S L n r mod uh, stabilizer uh, of some favorite lambda node uh, inside S L n r. It just allows you to put it in a in the scheme of uh, homogeneous space. Okay, so. Um, that's the space I'm going to to consider, but maybe um, something which is more familiar to to many of us, uh, and which allows us to um, you know maybe I'll, I'll I'll reach it in a moment. Um, yeah. So so I said that the, the basic question that I'm going to discuss is how do uh, these directional lattices behave when I fix lambda and I let uh, the vector vary um, uh, in the countable set of uh, primitive uh, lattice vectors. Uh, so you see that I get a, a countable collection uh, in x n minus one n, um, and I want to discuss uh, properties of this countable collection of, of points in this space. Um, and somehow my my point of view is is more dyna dynamical, so I'm uh, or kind of statistical, if you wish. So I, I want to discuss their distribution. So how how are they distributed in the space, and what kind of statistics uh, do these uh, uh, n minus one lattices, uh, directional lattices, uh, exhibit? Um, but I know that this is a, a somewhat uh, a number theory seminar, so I don't want to. Uh, burden the the audience with uh, with too much uh, kind of too much notions that are um, I, I think it's it's enough for me in order to advertise the results to discuss even topological results rather than rather than to uh, go all the way through distributional results. So um, I want to. Maybe I'll state a, like simplified versions of the results where 
I'm, I'm only considering uh, topological statements regarding uh, this space. And I think that uh, it becomes nicer and more easy to understand when we discuss shapes. So let's, uh, let's discuss the, uh, the map shape. And this is a map <clears throat> from, uh, from X n minus one n uh, to a space which is, uh, I think, more uh, familiar to, to everyone in the audience, especially for the case n equals three, when we are discussing two lattices in R3. So um, what is the shape of an n minus one lattice? I want to take my, uh, let me use the, um, the laser to show it. So suppose you have a, a, a hyperplane and in it, an n minus one lattice, this is my lambda. That's a point inside uh, x n minus one n. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate it uh, into uh, a, like a fixed uh, reference uh, copy of R n minus one. And then I get a lattice uh, in there, but the, the object that I get this way, since the rotation is not well defined, it's not really a lattice up to scaling, it's lattice up to scaling and rotation. So you get a point in uh, SLN minus one R mod SLN minus one Z, that's the space of lattices in, in my standard copy of RN minus one. And then I need to further quotient out from the other side by SON minus one R. These are the rotations because the rotation to that reference plane was not well defined. Uh, and in the case uh, n equals two, this is the, uh, sorry, n equals three, namely n minus one is equal to two. This is the usual uh, fundamental domain in the upper half plane. So we actually get uh, the shapes are kind of points in a, in a very familiar space. Um, and what I want to say about the shape is that shape, uh, shape forgets uh, the shape map forgets a compact uh, a compact amount of information uh, because what you what you miss when you just consider the shape is the uh, uh, position of the hyperplane so the the, the hyperplane uh, in which your n minus one lattice sits in that's something that you forget. And you also forget uh, the rotation or the position of the of your lattice in that plane up to rotation, up to an isometry, um, and that's another compact piece of information. So, studying uh, things in x my n minus one n, it, this is the right thing for me. But uh, we can interpret the results also in this more familiar space. In particular, on this space, um, there is a nice. Uh, probability measures, uh, like a uniform probability measure coming from the HAR measure of SLN minus one R, uh, which allows, kind of easily allows you to uh, discuss uh, distributional results. Uh, okay, so um, let me now um, discuss the conditioning. So, um, So maybe I, 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 that's the, maybe the main result that I want to, to talk about. Uh, so, so let uh, Q, um, I, I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm restricting attention to N equals three. Uh, and I'm going to do something very kind of concrete and, and uh, um, straightforward. So let Q be uh, an indefinite uh, quadratic form, or maybe I should say rational quadratic, quadratic form, rational quadratic form uh, in three variables. You can think of x squared plus y squared minus z squared if you want, or as an example. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to look at uh, uh, 
SQ is going to be the level set. So this is the variety of all vectors in R3 uh, such that um, Q of V is little Q. So I'm, uh, and I want to uh, consider level sets which contain uh, primitive integral points. So I'll define SQ of Z to be uh, simply the intersection of SQ with the Z3 prim. And this would be the surface on which uh, we condition the directional lattices. Um, and the question uh, that I'm going to study today is what can be said about uh, the collection of directional lattices uh, of the integral lattice. So I'm restricting attention to Z3 uh, and I'm taking V inside the primitive vector, uh, Z3 vectors on this quadratic surface. Um, yeah, and please, uh, I'm uh, I'm feeling quite alone here. So uh, if you guys have questions or uh, any comments, please feel free to uh, to do that. Um, okay, so that's the question, and here's the theorem uh, of myself and uh, uh, and Uri Badel. Uh, and we prove uh, for any uh, Q non-zero such that uh, SQZ is non-empty. So you choose a, a level set which contains integral points uh, and it's not the light cone. Um, we have that uh, the set of directional lattices is dense. Uh, so to claim density, I need to to uh, take the shape because the the actually the um, the position of the plane in the Grassmannian, the, the planes of the um, directional lattices is uh, obviously not dense um, because somehow, yeah, um, I hope I'll comment on that. But uh, if I want to simplify it, I'll just, uh, discuss the shapes, uh, so the shapes of the directional lattices uh, as V runs through SQZ uh, is dense in, uh, in the space of shapes in SL2R uh, mod SL2Z mod SL2. Um, and in fact, there is uh, there is uh, an equidistribution statement here, and this is um, in fact how the the proof is. Uh, th that's how I'll I'll explain the proof. Um, but the equidistribution statement is is a bit delicate to to explain what what I mean by equidistribution because this is just a countable set, uh, and um, I'll get to that. Uh, maybe later, but for for the moment, this is the theorem that I want to uh, discuss, and um, um, I guess that I, I want to dedicate the the um, uh, the talk to the to discussion discussing the structure of the proof. So the plan uh, is to discuss uh, the structure of the proof. And as I said, uh, the reason that I'm kind of, I, I cut all the history and didn't uh, didn't give any, almost any background because I think uh, it would be very nice to to explain the structure of the proof because it's, it's a very um, cool interaction between uh, dynamics and, and, uh, and this question. Okay, so um, any questions so far for the, uh, for the statement and the objects. Okay. Since you solicited questions, I'll ask a question. Yeah. Um, 
just to be speculative, like for what class of varieties with infinitely many integral points do you expect this to hold? Is this, is things like this supposed to be always true and you can prove it for quadrics or what do you expect? Um, so I, I would say that just it's a wishful thinking what, what, what I'm saying. It's not a it's not an educated thing, but uh, the philosophy that I would like to see here um, and it, it it is demonstrated in the analysis that, uh, that this work shows is that uh, you'll see density unless you have a good reason not to see. You see what I mean? It's like the uh, some sort of rigidity. Either there is a, a um, an algebraic reason that makes you uh, non-dense, um, or if there is no such obvious reasons, you are dense. The problem is that, as, as I've learned from this work, sometimes the reasons for non-density are, are a bit hidden. It takes time to... to uh, uncover them, it's not always that clear to identify what would be a reason a reason for you to uh, for, for violation of density. Yeah, I mean, just to say, I feel like I think this is very much in the spirit of material mining type questions where there was an initial conjecture and then there were sort of subtle reasons for things to go wrong that have sort of steadily been uncovered over the years. So. Yeah, thanks. Could you remind me uh, the, the name of the conjecture you mentioned? The, the Batyarev Manin conjectures. I don't want to go in a whole thing. We'll talk yeah. later. About okay, it. maybe I'll ask you later. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to hear about that. Yeah, so the, the history of this uh, of this uh, theorem, yeah, maybe maybe at the end, I, I would, uh, if I have enough time, I'll, I'll tell you some uh, uh, picanteri about the, the history of that, because there was a a similar story to what you said. So it, it took us time to understand the subtleties, and uh, yeah, now for for this example, we understand the subtleties. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll take advantage of uh, of Jordan's um, uh, question to say that this is part of a, 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 like I'll, I'll translate this question to dynamics in a, in a moment. But um, I want to say that uh, behind the scene, there's a, an attempt. Of mine and and other people, of course. I mean, uh, yeah, even so, the, the the dynamics community now is trying to understand uh, actions on such spaces. So these are not really the x n minus one n is not g mod gamma. It's not a um, a Lie group divided by a lattice uh, because it has a projective uh, component to it, right? It's uh, these are lattices in hyperplanes, uh, so it has a it's a bundle over the Grassmannian, um, and I'll, I'll get to it uh, later on. So, but every it's a bundle over the Grassmannian of hyperplanes. But in every, if you fix the hyperplane, what you see in the fiber uh, is a space of lattices. So it's a kind of I call them uh, hybrid homogeneous spaces. They are a hybridization of uh, projective varieties with G mod gamma fibers. Uh, and it turns out that uh, um, the dynamics on 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 projective spaces is very well understood, but behaves in one way. And the dynamics on G mod gamma is, I would say, very well understood, but behaves differently. And somehow taking these two worlds and putting them together is a challenge. It's not it's not an immediate thing, and apparently it uh, entails. Uh, new phenomena. So that's kind of a, a bigger scheme in which it falls uh, under. Thanks for the question. So uh, let's uh, let's discuss the structure of the proof. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, use a ah so first of all I want to do a um a reduction to dynamics. Okay so Let's uh, let's see. On the surface, I have my my surface, uh, and on it I have a a vector v, uh, which is a, an integral point. And now I can I can start acting on v uh, with S O Q of z, and get a a lot of uh, uh, integral points on the surface. Uh, and it's this group that will uh, the the dynamics. Uh, of, of this group, or, or maybe the transpose inverse of it, 
would uh, would allow me to uh, discuss the the projections of Z3 onto the ortho complement. So uh, here's the uh, things that I want to collect. Uh, first fact is maybe a uh, small, small exercise show that um, um, for any three for any matrix uh, and any vector the uh, the ortho complement of GV is just G star uh, V perp where G star is the transpose inverse of a matrix. Um, so if you believe that, let's ask ourselves, what can we say about the directional lattice in direction GV uh, of Z3, where G is in this uh, uh, SO Q of Z. So it preserves the, the quadratic form Q, but it's an integral matrix. So it also preserves uh, the lattice Z3. And in fact, uh, instead of understanding this lattice, let me understand its dual, okay? So the dual of this lattice, um, if you think of it, so uh, the directional lattice always lives in the ortho complement of the, of the vector. So it's uh, a bunch of vectors W in GV uh, perp. Um, but what is GV perp because of this, uh, this thing? It's just the G star, uh, it's G star applied to V perp. Uh, and what is the uh, duality condition? So I need the inner product of my directional lattice, sorry, of the W with my directional lattice to be uh, in Z, right? That's the definition of a dual lattice in a, in a space. Uh, but the thing is, the, direct, the directional lattice that I'm considering here, uh, the dual of which I'm taking, is obtained by projecting Z3 modulo uh, that vector. So um, if I add to the projections uh, uh, multiples of that vector, since my, my uh, uh, W is in the ortho complement of that vector, uh, I don't change the inner product, so it's the condition WZ3 uh, is in Z. And this just means that uh, uh, W is an integral vector. So, so this thing is just uh, the intersection of the uh, hyperplane G star V perp with, um, with Z3. Now, since Z3 is stable under G star, I can add it here. And then I can take it out and see that it's uh, this object. But by the same reverse uh, in reverse logic, this is just this lattice is the dual of the direction lattice of uh, of Z three in direction V. So so I get uh, G star uh, D V Z three star. Okay. In total, what I what I wanted to achieve by by this uh, string of uh, equalities is that the dual uh, of the lattices that I'm interested in when I'm when I'll go over uh, all this orbit of integral points, these duals are just the orbit of a of a fixed two lattice under uh, the transpose inverse of this group. Okay. So. Um, so we are reduced, reduced to understand uh, orbits uh, of two lattices under um, groups like uh, S O. So let me call it Q star. There is a um, a different quadratic form giving this uh, giving this group uh, Z. Okay, and this is a this is the lattice uh, in a uh, semi simple uh, group, and in particular, it's the Ritzky dance. And this is a, this is the setting in which we analyze the the situation here. Uh, but I don't want to kind of, I want to keep it uh, simple-minded and not uh, lo lose anybody. So I, I'm, I want to explain 
uh, the the strategy of the proof um, in, from a simple-minded point of view. So, um, but but now I see that what I need to do is I need to understand what happens when I take a two lattice. This is this uh, dual of uh, I, I pick my favorite vector on the surface. Uh, I take uh, uh, the direction lattice and take its dual, and then apply all all those uh, integral matrices to to this two lattice. And I'm, I'm trying to understand what's going on. So the point of view that I'm going to take is is a is a random walk approach. So we analyze. Uh, the orbits by uh, studying uh, random walks. Now, uh, I know that this is not the cup of tea of many of the audience, so I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that, and and that's that's the kind of the the heart of the talk. Um, so. Um, what is a random walk? What's the, the approach here? Uh, take take uh, F to be a finite uh, set of, uh, let me call this group H, uh, or maybe I'll call it gamma. Uh, so gamma is finitely generated, uh, finitely generated discrete subgroup, and I'm going to take a, a finite set of generators. Maybe think of uh, six generators, so so it will uh, correspond to throwing a die. Uh, and let's take mu to be um, the the die, the probability measure corresponding to throwing a die, uh, representing picking at random one of the generators. So this is a a probability measure, uh, a very non fancy one. So it's a uh, one over. Uh, the size of the set F, sum uh, gamma in F, uh, delta gamma. So this is a notation for uh, notation for a law of how to pick uh, at random at random an element of f. Now, the random walk, uh, just heuristically, what's going to, to happen is that I'm going to start with a two lattice lambda. I'm going to denote it by a point. And then I'm going to hit it with uh, gamma 1, and then with uh, gamma 2, and then with gamma 3. And the gamma i's are chosen uh, with respect to uh, mu. So I throw the die mu and wh whatever I see, I choose a, a, a gamma from F and apply it. And this way I do a random walk. The randomness is, is uh, coming from the from throwing the die. Okay, and now the, the probabilistic point of view is allows me to maybe understand what happens to random walks uh, in the space of two lattices in R3 as we do this. Uh, so I want to think, I know that many of the audience are not used to think of uh, probability measures. I want to think of probability measures uh, in two ways. Uh, first, first interpretation of a, of a probability measure is a law of how to pick uh, a point at random. And that's one. So every time I'll describe a, a, a mechanism to uh, pick something at random, I'm describing a probability measure. And the second um, interpretation of a probability measure is that if, uh, let's say, uh, mu, uh, or maybe I'll call it uh, eta, uh, is a probability measure on x, then uh, I can view it as a functional on, on the space of continuous functions with the compact support because uh, whenever I have a function, I can send it to the integral of the function with respect to the measure, the average, uh, uh, and that's uh, so so uh, probability measures are a part of a, a nice 
topological vector space of uh, fun of linear functionals. And this this will allow us both to kind of take uh, linear combinations, etc., and and also to take limits uh, in with respect to some topology that I'll, I'll describe uh, later. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I want to uh, advance to describing the the strategy of the proof. So, what's the strategy of the proof? Strategy. Ah, before the strategy of proof, I need a concept. The concept is the concept of a stationary measure. So definition, uh, a probability measure, uh, nu on uh, x23. So on the space on which I act is uh, mu stationary. Um, so recall that throughout mu would be this one. I, I fixed mu to be uh, just the, the law of choosing at random a generator according to the uniform probability measure on the set of generators. So I call a measure on the space of two lattices, mu stationary, if, uh, well, I think that I, I should, before that I should define a convolution. So, sorry. Um, so given uh, a probability measure on x to three, uh, I want to define a new probability measure, which I call mu convolution. So what, what is this? It's supposed to be a probability no, law on x to three of how to pick at random uh, a lattice in x to three. And the law is that you first pick at random with respect to nu. So nu, uh, so lambda is a uh, nu randomly picked. And then you apply uh, uh, gamma to it. So you move from lambda to a, a, another one according to mu, okay? And this gives you a random lattice uh, in the sec in uh, a new random lattice. So it, it gives you a probability measure. It, formally, this is just uh, one over F sum gamma in F uh, and I push nu with gamma, okay? But I, I want you to think of it as as I described it, as a law of how to pick it random from nu and then perform one, one step with uh, um, a random element chosen according to mu. Okay, now the definition of, uh, of stationarity. Uh, so nu is mu stationary if uh, mu convolution nu is again nu. So here, here's an example of a stationary measure. Take, uh, take this uh, rectangle and take, uh, let's say one, one of the gammas shrink the, uh, the rectangle to its left side and the other uh, gamma shrinks it to its other side. Uh, so uh, if I pick at random a point in the rectangle without doing anything, so this is choosing with respect to nu, or if I pick at random and then with probability half shrink it to this side or with probability half shrink it to this side, then I get the same probability law. So the uniform probability measure on the rectangle is stationary with respect to the two maps that I described uh, in this example. So that's the notion of stationarity. The, the, the measure need not be invariant under single elements of, uh, of the group, but somehow altogether uh, they are relevant. They, they are invariant. Okay, so that's the, the notion of stationarity and the structure of the proof is going as follows. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, keep, uh, I keep correcting myself, sorry. I want to explain, before the structure of the proof, I want to, to explain a key fact about stationary measures. So key point about uh, stationary measures um is that if i start with say uh dirac mass at uh, lattice lambda uh, whose orbit i want to study and then i'll take uh convolution with mu maybe uh k times so this uh this thing uh is usually denoted 
uh, mu to the power of k. Uh, and then I'm going to, since these are measures and uh, probability measures, and I told you that I can average them, then I'll just take some k runs from one up to capital N and take one over N. So this is a, an average of convolutions. And if you think of this, of, of the, opa, of this, uh, um, if you think of the probability law that this describes, what it tells me is that I start from lambda and then I start picking at random elements according to mu and do a, a k-step random walk. Uh, each For each k, I get this way a probability measure and then I further average them over the length of the random walk. But what's nice about this average is that uh, uh, this is a sequence of measures. Let me call them... Uh, uh, I don't know, A, uh, K, mu, lambda. That's the input of them. So if you think of, of those probability measures, A, K, mu, lambda, uh, they are becoming more and more stationary in the sense that uh, what do you know about uh, if, I'll, if I'll take a convolution of this uh, with mu and I'll subtract this thing, uh, then uh, this convolution is a linear operator, so it comes in and it makes this a plus one. So the so the sum is running from two to n plus one, and almost everything cancels out, but uh, the two extreme terms. So this goes to zero uh, in the space of measures, uh, and what it means is that any uh, any limit of uh, of a k mu lambda is stationary, and uh, we can always take the, the topology on measures is is so nice that we can always take uh, limits. Okay, uh, and the strategy of proof. So uh, I'm, I'm finally getting to it. Strategy of proof is the first step is to classify uh, all ergodic uh, mu stationary measures. Uh, and the point is that there are very few. There are very few. There are uh, countably many. I want to call them bad ones. Uh, and there is a unique good one. Um, so so how does the proof go? So you, you you need to classify that this is like the the main the main part of the proof is this classification. It goes, I should mention here uh, Benoit Kant and uh, and uh, Eskin Linenstrauss, uh, because we kind of in order to get such a classification, you need to uh, to use their techniques. Um, and the the point that I want to make is that uh, first I I want to describe what is the what is the unique good one, uh, and ignore for a second the countably many bad ones, although they 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 are very very interesting. So. Um, in order to explain the, the, the unique good one and, and uh, explain how to finish the argument, I want to describe the structure of X23 as a bundle over the Grassmannian of two planes in R3. Uh, and let me call this projection pi. This, this map just uh, takes a, a lattice in a plane and just uh, attaches to it the plane itself. So it forgets, forgets the lattice itself. Um, and if you have a, a stationary probability law on, on X23, clearly you have a stationary probability measure on the plane because the, you just forgot some information. It's not uh, um, the plane also uh, was chosen stationarily if, if, uh, the la if the two lattice was chosen stationarily. So, uh, and it turns out that on the space of, on the Grassmannian, there exists a unique uh, mu stationary measure 
this is the fact this is a, a a result of Furstenberg and it has to do with the fact that uh, uh, this S SOQ acts uh, irreducibly um, on on R3 and uh, and with an extra property which is called proxi proximality uh, but anyway down here there is a unique unique stationary measure which we call uh, nu bar and it's a, it's actually supported on a circle of planes which i want to call c so this is the circle uh, of isotropic planes for the uh, isotropic planes these are the planes that are tangential to the light cone Um, and and so any stationary measure on the space of two lattices in R3 must be supported on the space of, if this is the light cone, uh, on, on lattices which are tangential to the light cone. So uh, pi minus one of C, let me call it uh, C tilde. So this is the bundle, uh, bundle, of two lattices uh, in isotropic planes. Um, okay. Um, okay, and on each on each uh, plane. So if if I have a plane, um, let me describe to you a certain measure. So I'm, call, I'm going to call it m u, is the integral. Uh, I'm choosing at random a plane p according to the first measure, and then uh, inside that plane, I'm choosing a random two lattice according to the uniform measure on the space of lattices at that plane. Okay, so that's a. This is a. This is a natural uh, mu stationary measure. And the nice thing about it is that although it's only supported on uh, planes which are tangential to the light cone, inside each plane I see all possible uh, lattices. Okay, And the bulk of the proof, so we show that uh, the measures uh, of the random walk, a k lambda, uh, how did I denote it? Uh, mu lambda, mu lambda, they converge to m mu. And the reason they converge is that uh, we have such a good classification. So I mentioned to you that they must converge to a, a stationary measure. Um, and if you look at the at the classification, you have countably many bad ones and a unique good one, which is uh, which is this uh, this m mu, uh, which I want I want to establish that my sequence converges to m mu. So I need to show you that uh, I cannot accumulate mass on these countably many bad ones. And this is the second part, second ingredient part of the uh, kind of major ingredient part is to show that those countably many bad ones are sitting on manifolds. These are actually circles in the space X23, um, which are unstable. So my random walk, when it comes close to them, it gets pushed away. So uh, these averages uh, that we mentioned here, the averages of the random walk, um, they cannot accumulate mass on the, on the countably many bad um submanifolds so we're only we end up with uh with the fact that we must converge to the to this unique one and this is what gives us the density because the support of this measure as i said in each plane uh in which the support uh, touches it actually uh, you get a, a dense collection or or you get a full support uh in that in the space of lattices in that plane yeah so i i think now it's a 9.50 and I, I've been told that my talk is 50 minutes. So I think I, I managed to say what I wanted uh, in a very rough way, but uh, maybe I'll stop here and ask for questions.